Our scripture in this afternoon you will find in the gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 12. I will read from Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 49. These words. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house there will be divided five, three against two, and two against three. And they will be divided, father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? Why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out, of, get out until you have paid the very last penny. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And now comes the text. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Beloved congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ, the signs of the times, oh yes, people love to hear about them and to talk about them, right? There's always something mysterious, and at the same time, something that intrigues us about the signs of the times. The topic captivates our attention. Well, now, in our text, the Lord Jesus talks about the signs of the times. So it is, you see, that a question now presents itself. This question, what is it that makes something a sign of the times? And 
Who determines that? Who says what is and what is not important? So important that it qualifies to be spoken of as a sign of the times. For example, I'm sure you'll all agree the 2020 election results in the U.S., whether you like them or not is not the question here, but those election results are important, perhaps even for Canada. The media has not stopped talking about them to this very day, right? But what do you think? Is that election more a sign of the times than, say, the teaching of the National Association of Women, which openly, brazenly advocates that marriage and the family must be destroyed, and that a woman, to be really free, must be a lesbian. Which is the more important, as a sign of the times, the fact that people perpetually worry about the economy, or the fact that the churches in the land are less and less attended, never mind COVID-19 now, and that the New Age move, movement is gaining converts left and right. How do you decide? See, we all distinguish between important world-stirring events and the everyday sort of occurrences. But, but by what criteria do we come to assign importance to the various events in the world, in our community, in our own lives? Is it important, do you think, is it important that you come to church? Is the proclamation of the word and having fellowship with God's people important to you? Does it disturb you when you are being deprived of that? In our text for this afternoon, we hear Jesus talking about a very common and ordinary thing. A man, he said, a man had a vineyard. And in that vineyard, he had also planted a fig tree. For the past three years, this man had come to this fig tree looking for fruit. I think you will agree there is nothing so unusual about that at all. If you know anything at all about a farm, specifically about a fruit farm, then you know how a farmer will do just that. In the fall of the year, he will go out there, out to his fields, his orchards, to look for fruit. It is a very common phenomenon. Well, just so this man had done for three years. For three years he had come looking for fruit. So Jesus said in the story he told. That story, you understand, was a parable. The question is, why did Jesus tell this parable? For us to understand that, yes, for us to understand the meaning and the significance of this parable, we've got to see it to understand it in the context wherein Jesus told it. That is why it is important, you see, that we go back for a moment to those closing verses of chapter 12. Jesus had been talking about the signs of the times there. He had warned his listeners, the crowd that followed him, he had warned them to discern the time, the signs of the times. 
When you see a cloud rising in the west, he said, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be a scorching heat. And it happens. But how is it then, you hypocrites, how is it that you are able to read, to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but do not know how to interpret the present time? You hear it. Jesus is upset. Ah, oh, yes, he was angry. He says, you people, you people should be able to interpret the present time. How come you're not doing it? Chapter 13 then begins by saying that at that very time, there were some people in the crowd who reported two events to Jesus. And you can be sure, most people would agree that those true events were extraordinary events. Oh yes, they were terribly devastating events. The first event involved an action on the part of Pilate, who was no friend of the Jews, you can be sure. Pilate had killed a number of Galileans. Apparently, as they were in the act of presenting, of offering their sacrifices in the temple. And the blood of those Galileans had gotten mingled with the blood of the animals that had just then been sacrificed. Oh yes, that that was a terrible thing all would agree. Just think for a moment. The blood of those animals was intended to cover and so to, was, was to remove the sins of the people presenting those sacrifices. But now, now because their own blood had become mingled with the blood of those animals, now their sacrifices had become impure, unclean. In other words, their sacrifices were null and void. And they could never correct that. They could never again present a clean sacrifice because they had been killed. Oh, you can be sure, the Jew reflecting on that, the Jews said to themselves, no doubt, no doubt the Lord God is severely punishing those people. They must have been great sinners. And see, this was the second major catastrophe in a short time that had struck the people. Only a short while before this event, no less than 18 people had been killed when the tower in Siloam had toppled over on top of them. That's something like a fierce storm, a tornado, a hurricane, or some other major disaster, killing hundreds of people in short order. But now, you can be sure, such extraordinary events had stirred and do stir the people. Think, for example, of the way we today talk about matters relating to world peace or to the effect, uh, effects of COVID-19. Well, when you listen carefully to the way Jesus talked about the events of his day, 
then you cannot fail to hear him say to the Jews, I know. Oh yes, I know how you people think about such things. You see, Jesus knew that the Jews of his day had a ready answer. As a matter of fact, they thought they had a logical explanation for such occurrences. Does anything happen outside of, independent of, the all-powerful, the all-governing, the all-controlling hand of God? They asked. Of course not, they said. Well then, they said, if it is true that God governs all things, which surely he does. See, then it must follow that he, the Lord God, he caused the death of those Galileans, right? How could it possibly be otherwise? Clearly, Pilate was only an instrument a tool in the hands of the Lord through whom the Lord God had struck down those Galileans. And those 18 people, precisely the 18 that were killed, you understand, surely it was the Lord God, the Almighty, who had directed those 18 people to be there when and where the tower in Siloam would topple. So, the conclusion is fairly simple, said the Jew. Those Galileans and those 18 people in Siloam, oh yes, they must have been very sinful people. Else why, why were they the ones that were killed? I'm sure you recognize that way of thinking. You find it expressed also in the story of the healing of the blind man. The disciples then asked Jesus, remember, Rabbi, who, who sinned, this man or his parents? Oh yes, for them it was obvious the one or the other had to be the case. After all, the Lord is a just God, is he not? He surely would not cause someone to be born bl blind if there were not a good reason for it, would he? Well then, that reason, they thought, would have to be a serious sin had been committed by those directly involved in the catastrophe. Hear now how Jesus answers those who have told him about the death of those Galileans. Do you think, he asks, Yes, do you people think, really, that those Galileans, the ones who had been killed, were worse offenders, worse sinners, than all other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way. And do you therefore think that you can pat yourselves on the back do you think that you can piously thank the Lord that you are not as sinful, not as wicked, not as evil as they obviously must have been? No, I tell you, says Jesus. As a matter of fact, unless you repent, you will all likewise 
perish. <coughs> Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Oh no, he does not say those Galileans who died, they were good people, innocent people. Nothing of the kind. Rather, he says, you, you are just as sinful, just as wicked, just as evil as they were who were killed. You hypocrites, he had said earlier, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? In other words, how is it possible that you people do somehow see the hand of God in the death of those Galileans now those 18, 18 people in Siloam, but at the same time fail to, I guess, refuse to hear the call of God that you must repent. Clearly, Jesus is exposing the sin of the people whom he's addressing. He is saying to them that their theology has in fact led them to shut off, yes, to shut up the voice of God as he sought to address them in and through the events of the day. That is, in and through the signs of the times. See that, that is why he now says to them, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Twice Jesus says those words, Twice he called attention to the seriousness of those extraordinary events. And then, yes, then he told the parable of the barren fig tree. <coughs> and see, for us to understand the meaning and the potency of that parable, we must read it against the background of those extraordinary events Jesus had just talked about. Jesus told a very simple story. A story about an everyday sort of thing. A man, he said, had planted a vineyard and he had also planted a fig tree in that vineyard. Oh, you can be sure he had bestowed great care upon his vineyard. And so it is that for three years he had come to his vineyard, especially looking for the fruit of that fig tree, but found None. What was Jesus saying? What did he want the people to whom he had just spoken about the seriousness of the extraordinary events that had happened? What did he want those people to hear, to understand? Well, you see, that fig tree was symbolic of Israel. In other words, by talking about that tree, Jesus was really talking about the covenant people of the Lord. Jesus was saying to his audience, listen, 
The Lord your God, Yahweh, God of the covenant, the Lord has for these three last years cared for you, his fig tree, as never before. First he sent John the baptizer to you. And John, as you people well know, John had preached the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Oh yes, John had called you back to the God of the covenant. And then, said Jesus, yes, then I began my ministry. I not only preached the good news to you, salvation through my work, but I also performed miracles. I showed you many signs. I did that in order that you might believe that I am the Christ, and that believing you might have life in my name. You understand? <coughs> I worked hard, says Jesus, in order that you, the Israel of God, in order that you might come to fruit bearing. And now, now the Lord your God is looking for fruit, for the fruit of righteousness on my labors. Now he may expect to find that fruit. Remember now, for a long time already, the Lord had done very little work on his fig tree Israel. From the days of Malachi up to the coming of John the baptizer, a period of some 400 years, there had been no new revelation from the Lord. No prophet had spoken any new word to the children of the covenant for 400 years. Then, altogether unexpectedly, you can be sure, then John had come. John had been sent by God, and so it was becoming clear. The Lord God was sparing no effort now to bring Israel, his fig tree, to fruit bearing. And think of it, before John had finished his task, Jesus had begun his ministry. And see, Jesus too had worked with great intensity on that fig tree, but it had all been to no avail. The Lord God, the owner of the vineyard, had come looking for fruit, but there was no fruit to be found. See, that is when the owner of the vineyard uttered that devastating judgment. Cut it down. Cut it down. Why should it juice up the ground? The fig tree had been, had remained barren, fruitless, and therefore was useless. It was only a burden to the ground. It had denied its reason for being. Remember now, Jesus told this parable in response to the people's reaction to those two events, the killing of some Galileans by Pilate and the death of those 18 people who had died when the tower in Siloam had fallen on them. Jesus now effectively said to the crowd hearing him, yes, 
Oh yes, I know. I know that those two events got your attention. But, but my question is, why, what? What have you done with John, with his preaching, with his call to repentance? You people remember John, don't you? Surely you remember that John preached and that he baptized for many years. He was a messenger sent to you from God. Yes, John was a herald crying in the wilderness. John called you to prepare the way of the Lord to make his paths straight. But about what have you people done with John? What have you done with his message? Isn't it so that at first perhaps you were intrigued by John? But you soon accepted him as a common phenomenon. You people said, oh yeah, no doubt John is preaching somewhere in the wilderness of Judea again today. But so what? He did the same thing yesterday and last year, and no doubt he'll do the same thing tomorrow. You understand? That, you see, that's how the people had responded to the ministry of John. And that is how they were responding to the ministry of Jesus also. Jesus also had been preaching. Jesus also had preached the gospel of the kingdom. But, but, but who got excited about that? Who was stirred to action, to faith and repentance by that? Oh yes, a miracle still caught their attention. But they failed to see, yes, they refused to accept that the miracles Jesus performed were meant to underscore the reality, the truth, and so the utter seriousness of the word he preached. The people simply blithely dismissed the preaching of Jesus. They treated it as a common and everyday sort of thing. And they never understood that it's precisely the common, the everyday sort of things that are so very serious much more serious than the extraordinary things happening on an occasion. See, the Jews said, 18 people dead at the tower in Siloam. The Jews said, a number of Galileans killed by Pilate in the temple. That's like the crash of a commercial airliner shot down by enemy fire, don't you understand? Yes, it's like a major winter storm killing dozens of people in one shot. But God says, for three years, the gospel was preached to you. God says, oh no, I did not for three years stir you up by means of all sorts of extraordinary things, accidents, killings, natural catastrophes, not at all. Rather, for three years, I try to reach you, to touch you, to move you to faith and to the obedience of faith by means of the preaching of the word. I sent to you the messengers of the covenant in whom was and is my delight. Why did God 
the owner of the vineyard, want to destroy the fig tree? Why would Israel be cast off? Is it because the people fail to come with some right explanation about the meaning of some extraordinary events of the day? Oh no, surely not. Rather, Israel will be cast off because she needed those extraordinary events. Ah uh, yes, Israel will be cast off because she adamantly refused to listen to the common, the everyday preaching of the word. Remember it well, Israel would and was cast off, not because she did not become sufficiently disturbed by the extraordinary things that were happening in the temple and at Siloam. Rather, she would be and she was cast off because she rejected the Christ who came to her as the Word of God incarnate who, as the son of the owner, came for the fruit of the vineyard, the fruit of righteousness, but found none. See that bloodbath in the temple and that accident at Siloam. They were indeed sad, tragic events. No one can deny that. But I would have those things happen 10 years earlier. Jesus could not have used them as sermon material on this occasion. The fact is, however, these events happened three years after John and Jesus had worked in vain. Now these events were alarm signals. Now they warned of the wrath of God. After all, nothing happens by chance, right? But remember well, the extraordinary things are so very serious because of the common, the everyday sort of things. Oh yes, they receive their significance, their seriousness from the common things. That is still so today. See, the unrest, the crisis resulting from the election in the U.S. has many people concerned to this very day. And their response is anything but unto healing, you can be sure. And lawlessness, uniquely in this time of the COVID crisis, is becoming ever more rampant. And the unrest in the world is ever intensifying because of conflicting ideologies and who will be in control. But, about who? Who of us sees it? Who of us considers it that such extraordinary things are so very serious precisely because of the gospel preaching of many years? Who of us considers that the proclamation of the word today, here and throughout the world, is far more serious than all of those extraordinary things combined? See, today, as in the days of John and Jesus, today, people so easily take the word of the Lord for granted. You can hear it said in various ways. Why? Why get so concerned? 
If you don't hear the word proclamation today, why then there's always next week, right? Why get so concerned about hearing the word, about doing the word, about repentance, about repenting, and about obedience? There's always tomorrow, isn't there? Who considers that all who have heard the word must give an account, yes, must give an account to the Lord God, the Almighty, for what they have done with that word they heard. Cut down the unfruitful fig tree, said the owner, that is, said the Lord God. But the vine dresser, the Lord Jesus, see the vine dresser answered him, Sir, let alone this year also. Did you hear? Jesus prays, be merciful, Father. Be merciful for yet another year. Oh no, that prayer of Jesus does not at all deny the seriousness of the situation. As a matter of fact, now the situation becomes even more serious. After all, now the work on the fig tree would continue for yet another year. I will dig around it, said the vine dresser, and put on manure. In other words, think of it, the proclamation of the word by Jesus would go on with even greater intensity. You ask why? Well, because the Lord God looks for fruit. Jesus knew that. Hear him say, then, yes, then, if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. And see, that fig tree was cut down. Oh yes, the Lord indeed is merciful, and he surely is slow to anger. The Bible says that very clearly. Read, for example, Exodus chapter 34. He let Jerusalem taste the goodness of the Lord for yet another 40 years. But Jerusalem would not repent. Her citizens would not return to the Lord. Yes, they refused to walk in the way of covenantal obedience. And now consider it well. Remember, once the walls of the tower in Siloam, part of Jerusalem, had fallen down, killing 18 people. And Jesus had warned, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. But well, now, that warning, it was literally fulfilled when Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70 AD. Now remember, yes, remember it well, that word, it is a power still today. That word, it speaks to us today with all of its relevance and seriousness intact. That means, it means to warn us today. Hear the word of the Lord, it says to us, and do it. Live the truth. 
announce the salvation of the Lord to a world on the brink of disaster. Say to all people everywhere that Jesus Christ, his cross, and his victory is the answer, the only answer to the question of the peace in the world today. Live out of that faith, that conviction, today and every day. Then you will surely know, and yes, you will experience the peace of God and you will be blessed today and forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we have sought to listen to and to understand a portion of your word, a very serious word a word of warning and admonition. We pray, Father, that in this time, in this world situation, we, your people, who listen to your word, who know what the Spirit says to the church, who have tried to understand it also more clearly today, we pray, Father, that we may indeed humble ourselves before you and walk in covenantal obedience with you every day. So then, Father, we pray, grant us your grace and your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.